and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? As has been standard form for the last few weeks, we will begin with news on the CCP virus. One particular study of interest is coming out of the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. It strongly suggests that although France believes the first cases occurred in late January, there may have been an infection as early as late December. A retrospective analysis of samples taken from ICU patients with influenza-like symptoms from a Paris hospital has found at least one positive result. That is, a 42-year-old French resident who had not been to China, but was hospitalised on the 27th of December. That would strongly indicate that there is a underlying and somewhat insidious infection of the French population. This might also partially explain why parts of Europe have been hit so much harder than other parts of the world. It is thought that the earliest infections occurred around the 1st of December in Wuhan, China. There have been many months between that first infection and the present day. This has given much time for the CCP virus to mutate. That mutation has been tracked by the examination of 15,000 samples and the genome being sequenced. That process has identified a series of mutations. Fortunately, nothing has yet to affect the virulence of the CCP virus. What is Slightly more concerning is the identification of the CCP virus in sperm. This produces two possible considerations. One, quite simply, that it could become a sexually transmitted infection. Second, what effect it might have on offspring. The CCP virus remains a relatively unknown factor. We don't know a lot about its process its long-term implications, and everything we are discovering seems to only throw more confusion into the mix. These results were published in the JMAA Network Open Journal. They come from a very small sample of patients, roughly 38, who are being treated in a Henan province hospital. Fifteen of them provided a semen sample during the acute phase of being infected, and 23 after recovery. Some of the acute patients and a much smaller proportion of the recovered patients had the virus in their semen samples. This is consistent with studies into Ebola, where patients could continue to infect others months after they had recovered from the disease itself. The site itself, the testes, is considered immunoprivileged. That is, it's less significantly affected by inflammation and other immunological processes that are meant to knock down the virus and prevent it from infecting the body and or others after the fact. The WHO is yet again stepping into a landmine by commenting on the positive tests of patients who are said to have recovered. They are now claiming that it's not reinfection, but instead patients are expelling dead lung cells that have been infected with the virus. This all comes on reports from South Korea, where more than 100 cases that were thought to be reinfections of those who had already been infected were reported. For the most part, we don't know anything about whether or not patients can be reinfected. As has been mentioned previously, it is possible that from an immunological point, the body will need to be infected multiple times before it can develop sufficient immunity to ward off the disease immediately and in the short term. We're not even sure about how long the immunity will last, which means long-term immunity may not be possible. Natural immunity like this is only one possible option. In an ideal world, we're either going to have a medication to treat the SARS virus, or a vaccine. 
there are already a variety of drugs being tested, and 47 more have now been put forward. Understanding to some extent how the virus attaches itself to a cell and infects it is one step in that process. Knowing what receptor the CCP virus targets and how it utilizes it to get into the cell gives some idea on what drugs can be modeled to most effectively interfere with that interaction, thereby reducing the degree to which the CCP virus can infect cells and how severe that infection will become. This whole process has a number of lessons we need to keep in mind. First, they had to use African green monkey cells. This is because we don't yet know which of the human cell lines are best suited towards culturing the virus. Second, of the 47 drugs being tested, only a small fraction were successful at stopping or at least reducing the severity of the CCP virus. Third, and perhaps most importantly, there were a number of drugs that made the cells more susceptible to infection. These three particular points need to be kept in mind when considering any other drug being developed or investigated for its potential benefit. We need to look at what drugs are being used, how they're being tested, and why they're being tested. Once we know this, we can consider the findings and whether or not they can be extrapolated. Of the 47 drugs, there were two groups of drugs that they found were particularly beneficial and that they understood why these drugs were having the effect they have. Each of them was working in a different way, one of which is well established and the other had yet to be described. This is a good thing to understand. Knowing how and why the drugs are working the way they are means that you can expand the scope of the study and look at other drugs that might target a similar pathway. The two drugs identified are called Turnitin-4 and Zotatafin. These are currently used to treat multiple myeloma, and they work by binding to and inhibiting proteins in the cell needed for DNA translation. There is currently a clinical trial for a molecule similar to Turnitin-4 called Clitidepsin, the second avenue that the researchers identified are two receptors called Sigma R1 and Sigma R2. Those are promising avenues. What they found that is both promising but also discouraging is a seventh compound. It is a compound called dextromethorphan and is commonly found in cough syrup. Considering this and the nature of respiratory diseases, it stands to reason that people would probably be using it. The issue at hand is it does leave the cells more vulnerable to being infected, which in context is a very bad thing. These results will certainly need to be examined in greater detail and Better designed trials will be needed to understand whether or not they can be used effectively. One thing that was interesting to come out of their studies that adds on to everything else here, and what has been described previously, is the relationship with hydroxychloroquine. It also binds to the sigma R1 and sigma R2 receptors, but it is incredibly inefficient at doing so. If it's an inefficient binder, it's likely to lose out to other substances, which may in fact include the virus. If that's the case, if that is the case, then it may not provide the necessary protection. Further to that, hydroxychloroquine does bind to receptors in the heart, and this can cause damage. When you consider the combined effect at present of the CCP virus on the heart and lungs, Having an inefficient and somewhat ineffective treatment that could also add to the damage caused by the virus, you're creating a massive problem. In possibly related news, 
there are children in America and the UK presenting to the hospitals with a, something called Kawasaki disease. This has a possible relationship to the CCP virus. The disease itself involves inflammation of multiple organ systems and has an unknown origin. In America, at least 64 cases have occurred, and in the UK, there have been a smaller number of incidences. To further confuse this story, some of the children have tested positive for the CCP virus. It has primarily affected children between the ages of 2 and 15 years, the age group that has been thought to be least vulnerable to this disease. What makes this particular version of the Kawasaki disease distinct from the normal diagnoses is that there have been more severe abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting compared to what a patient would present with under usual circumstances. Kawasaki disease itself can be defined by a number of relatively specific symptoms, these being inflammation of the mouth and lips, a rash, swelling of the hands and feet, inflamed eyes and lymph nodes, and the swelling is typically only on one side of the neck for the lymph nodes. There are of course always going to be exceptions with incomplete cases. Going now from the CCP virus, we can look at some of the social sciences. We now have the most recent report on Finland's attempt to provide a universal basic income. The key headline coming out of this is that it makes people happier. That finding should come as no surprise to anyone. Being given money for nothing tends to make people happy. What we've also found is that it hasn't helped in encouraging people to search for employment. This comes from the Finnish Ministry of Social Affairs and Health most recent report. That is the very agency that was rolling this out and stopped the experiment in 2018. Next we have cause to start a religion. Apparently honeybees can trigger virgin births just by mutating a single gene. The church of the honeybee is unlikely to start any time soon, but we can at least explain what happens. The South Africa Cape honeybee has an interesting talent. It can invade another hive and, due to its oversized ovaries, can begin to secrete a pheromone that more or less allows it to take control of the new hive. Not only has it now taken control, but it benefits from this. Once it's in charge, it can begin to produce clones of itself. These clones become the worker bees. Now, when the queen dies, normally it would be taken over by a new queen, and this would then create some degree of genetic complexity. However, we don't find that in this species. Instead, since they are all clones of the queen, the queen effectively remains in power, with one of the worker bees eventually reaching that position. If you live in South Africa, you do not want your hive infected by this particular species of bee, as they will fundamentally destroy your productivity. Therefore, understanding what's going to happen here is very important, and that's where the research comes in. It is a mutation on a single gene on chromosome 11. It's called GB45239, and it modifies the honeybee's ability to create eggs. Not only are these eggs fertile, but they carry on identical genetic code from the adult. And this is either an example of a virgin birth or parthenogenesis, depending on which way you want to cut it. While we are talking about things that could be creepy, crawling, or furry, Arctic wolf spiders could be turning to cannibalism due to a sudden explosion in their population. The Arctic wolf spider will breed more profusely during longer, warmer summers. This then leads to them growing bigger and as they get bigger, they need to feed more. 
when you consider that the growing population provides that exact need, the wolf spiders may be beginning to eat each other simply to try and control the population. This self-limiting effect hasn't really been seen in the wild, but it has been observed in controlled experimental studies. Those experimental studies match with what is being seen. A larger female wolf spider population that is physically larger, but a decrease in the number of juveniles. The problem for the wolf spiders is the same problem we see with most species that turn to cannibalism. They don't seem to live as long or be as healthy as those that eat a varied diet. This could be a long-term problem for the stability of the species. Consider what happened with the koala in Australia, which has since become considerably inbred and prone towards a number of diseases such as chlamydia. Now for some somewhat positive and pleasant news. The Sumida Aquarium in Tokyo needs people to call in and FaceTime their 300 garden eels in order to encourage them to not be socially shy. They are asking people to call in and more or less look at the eels. This will help them to stay accustomed to the faces of humans and not be shy around them. This might seem like an odd request, but there's a reason for it. Simply put, if the aquarium animal keepers can't see the animals, they can't monitor them for help. And if they keep running away every time they see anyone, it's going to be impossible for the aquarium staff to keep them in check and make sure they are well looked after. Sadly, the request is only open to those who happen to have an iPhone or iPad. It would seem the aquarium has some particular penchant towards Apple devices. Going now from the oceans to the moon. In 1110, the moon effectively vanished from the sky. This resulted in a whole bunch of issues, not the least of which was social and environmental, and we weren't entirely sure of what caused this. Now we might have some idea. This is backed up by the identification of sulfur deposits in ice core samples. These deposits have previously been attributed to Iceland's Hekla volcano in 1104, but a new study looking at those ice core dating systems thinks that they may be off by a factor of four years, and if that's the case, it's not possible that a sample from four years before the volcano could possibly have any relationship to it. This is where historical records from the medieval period come in. These records contain references to a lunar eclipse in May of the year 1110. It's now thought that this extreme lunar eclipse, which shuttered all light to it, was a combination of the eclipse and volcanic aerosols in the stratosphere. These two events would have substantially altered the light that would have been seen, rather than the usual reddish hue of a lunar eclipse. Instead, there was no light to be seen at all. This is backed by historical records from 1108 of Japan's Mount Asuma erupting. There are also records from that year and the years that followed immediately afterwards there is also evidence from tree ring dating that came in these years and the years that followed of a decrease in temperatures up to one degree Celsius. Then there are historical records primarily relating to agriculture showing that across the world there was a significant decrease in crop production. Finally, we need to look at the mysterious X-37B space plane that went into space for an extended period and we had no idea why. And now it's going back, but at least we do have an answer as to its purpose. It's going to be jam-packed full of experiments. One is looking at the effect of different materials and how they survive in space. The second is whether or not ambient space radiation affects seeds, and, to spoil the ending, it should have some effect. 
Next is whether or not you can transform solar power in space into radio frequency energy and then transmit that energy back to Earth. Hopefully we won't be waiting the 780 days we did last time for the X37b to return to Earth before we can find out what the results are of this experiment. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions below.